Hello, my name is Philippe Girin, a professor in the history department at McNeese State University. And I am Rebecca Harris, a teacher and a local actress. And welcome to your Grandma Rocks, where we explore the lives of famous women in history. Welcome and bienvenue à nos amis francophones. Vous écoutez la radio de l'Université McNeese. On the program today, music and history as we retrace the life of a remarkable woman. She was an engineer, a pilot, and an astronaut who dedicated her life to science. Literally. She died during the Space Shuttle Challenger explosion. Along the way, we'll explore not just her career, but also the story of that tragic day in January 1986. Along the way, we'll also sample some classic songs about space, and there are a lot of good ones. Basically, a bunch of 1970s songs about space. And uh, we'll start with what may be the most famous of all the space songs and one of the most requested wake-up songs on the space shuttle. Here's Rocket Man by Elton John from 1972. She packed my bags last night, free flight. Zero hour, 9 a.m. And I'm gonna be high as a kite by then. I miss the earth so much, I miss my wife. Lonely out in space on such a timeless flight. And I think it's gonna be a long, long time. The touchdown brings me round again to find I'm not the man they think I am. Bonjour and welcome back to Your Grandma Rocks. We just listened to Rocket Man. Je m'appelle Philippe Girard. And I'm Rebecca Harris. And today we're exploring the life of U.S. astronaut Judith Resnick. Walk us through her early life, Philippe. Well, she went from Akron, Ohio. Like Neil Armstrong, the first man on the moon. And John Glenn, the first U.S. astronaut in space. And the Wright brothers, big state for U.S. aviation. And also a state with a large immigrant population from Central and Eastern Europe. Her parents, they were Jewish immigrants from the Ukraine. Was she a good student or athlete? Becoming an astronaut is super selective, so astronauts are often overachievers. Overachiever, that's the word. She was a talented, classical pianist, so good in fact that she thought of making it her career. She was good at science too, I guess. Yes, that, and languages, and math, and just, you name it. She graduated from high school as the valedictorian, and she earned a perfect score on her ACT exam. She was the only woman to do that nationwide that year in the U.S. Okay, smartest woman of her generation. Impressive. I guess she had her pick of the litter when going to college. Where did she go? Carnegie Mellon. She got her BS there in 1970. And what did she study? You said she was good at everything. Electrical engineering. That's not a subject often associated with women, unlike classical piano, for example. You're right. There were only two other women in her program at Carnegie Mellon. Why did she pick that field? Well, she loved math too, but she thought that subject was just too abstract. So she wanted a field with practical applications. Well, what kind of practical applications did she work on after graduating? Well, first she got a job at RCA, the electronics company, and there she worked on radar control systems for rockets. Smart. Well, smart in fact that she also got a PhD in electrical engineering at the University of Maryland. With honors, of course. <laughs> Very smart. Oh, and meanwhile, during all of that, she also worked as a research fellow in a biomedical engineering firm. <laughs> Very, very smart. I guess she had no free time whatsoever. Well, actually, she also had time to get a professional aircraft pilot license on the side. 
And of course, she got near perfect scores on her flying license test. Well, I'm running out of superlatives. Talented pianist, rocket engineer, pilot. She did it all. How many years did it take her to do all that? Well, we're still in the 1970s. She was still in her 20s. <laughs> wow. And on the personal side, during that time, she got married to a fellow student in 1970. And she also had the time to get divorced in 1975. And that's probably what impressed me the most. A divorce is the kind of event that can derail the best laid plans for years. Why did they separate? Well, mostly because he wanted children and she didn't. Even Wonder Woman couldn't change diapers and get a PhD and learn how to fly at the same time. So when did she show up on NASA's radar? Just about now, but first another 1970 song about space. Here's Space Baby by The Tubes from 1975. I'm Rebecca Harris. Et je suis Philippe Girard. Vous écoutez la radio de l'Université McNeese. Today we're exploring the life of U.S. astronaut Judith Resnick. So far we followed her from her childhood as a daughter of immigrants in Ohio, all the way to academic excellence as a student in the 70s. So when did NASA show up at her doorstep beginning to recruit her? That's not exactly how it works. A lot of talented people want to be astronauts. Also, all of the astronauts were men at the time. At least in the U.S. Russia had already sent a female cosmonaut in space. Yes, Valentina Tereshkova. She's on my list for a future show. Fun fact. Do you know why the U.S. began hiring female astronauts? To keep up with the Russians, I guess? Not really. It was because of Nichelle Nichols. The one who played Uhura on Star Trek? Yes. All the U.S. astronauts were basically white males with a military background. So she pushed NASA to broaden its recruiting pool. So any famous name that she helped to recruit? Well, Sally Ride, the first U.S. astronaut in space. All right. And Guyon Bluford, the first African-American in space. All right. And Judith Resnick. That's how our lady got a chance to become an astronaut. I didn't know that. 
But again, it was just a chance to become an astronaut. A lot of people wanted to be. In 1978, when NASA asked for applicants for a new, more diverse pool of astronauts, 8,000 people applied. And Resnick, she was just one of six women who made the cut. How did she get the idea? I mean, most people don't wake up in the morning and say, gee, I want to sit on top of a giant bomb and blast off into outer space. It was her advisor at Carnegie Mellon. He sought the world of her, and he's the one who encouraged her to apply. Though, of course, the story turned out tragically in the end. Yes, uh, the advisor actually later regretted having played an indirect role in her death. He said, she was an amazing person, I pushed her to excel, and I live with that memory every day. Mm, sad. So how did the training at NASA go? She was good at everything already, so what did they have left to teach her? Well, physical fitness for one. She had been kind of a science nerd, so she had not exactly spent her life in the gym, but she worked hard and she passed the physicals. And ultimately, she and Sally Ride, they were favorites to become the first US women in space. Though Sally Ride got the top prize, how did Judith Resnick react when she was passed over? She was disappointed, of course, but she didn't sweat it. Uh, when journalists noted that she would be the first Jewish person in space, she thought that all these kinds of first this, first that, they were just silly. Was she a practicing Jew? No, not even. She thought of herself as a scientist and as an astronaut first. Anyway, she soon got her chance in space. Sally Ride's first flight was in 1983. Judith Resnick, she followed in 1984. And what was her job? Did she fly the space shuttle? No, she was a mission specialist. Meaning? Uh, she was in charge of a big robotic arm to deploy and pick up science experiments in space. By the way, as an electrical engineer, she had helped develop the arm, too. That's pretty hardcore. Developing space tech on the ground and then flying it yourself. Which reminds me, at some point we need to get to that fateful day in 1986. We will, but after our next musical break. Are we done with the 70s yet? Oh no, here is supersonic rocket ship by the Kinks. That's from 1972. Let me take you on a little trip, my supersonic ship. At your disposal if you feel so inclined. All right. We're gonna travel faster than light, so do up your overcoat tight and we'll go anywhere you want to decide. Nobody has to be helped, nobody needs to be out of sight. Oh, out of sight, that's Nobody's gonna travel second class of the equality and no suppression of minorities. Bonjour à tous and welcome back to Your Grandma Rocks on KBYS. Je suis Philippe Hirat. And I'm Rebecca Harris. Today we're covering the life of astronaut Judith Resnick. Before our break, we saw how she first flew on the space shuttle in 1983. Now might be the time to talk a bit about this program. Not all our listeners are space nerds. Sure can. As you know, for the US, human spaceflight began in the early 60s with the Mercury and Gemini programs. 
Then NASA transitioned to the Apollo program, the one that brought Neil Armstrong to the moon in 1969. But that program was canceled because, well, it cost too much. So by the 1970s, NASA was in a bit of an existential crisis. That's where the space shuttle came in, a way to continue space exploration, but on the cheap. And the key word there was shuttle, because the orbiter would be reusable, going to space would be as cheap and safe as taking a bus. Except it wasn't exactly cheap. The big orange tank you see behind the rocket wasn't reusable. The two big boosters on each side were reused. But the process was so complicated that it cost as much as making a new set of boosters. The orbiter itself, the plane if you will, flew back to Earth. But it needed a lot of maintenance before it could be launched again. So not cheap at all. And not exactly safe either. Problem one, the shuttle came back from space as a glider and a terrible one at that. So either the pilots got it right on their first attempt or they would crash. There was no way to abort a landing and do a go around. Problem number two, that big external orange tank. It was covered in insulation foam to, because it was filled with liquid hydrogen and oxygen, but that foam had a tendency to break off during the ascent and then hit the orbiter. It was just foam, but when something hits you at hundreds of thousands of miles per hour, it's like a bullet. The shuttles often came back to Earth with big dents in the protective shield underside, which was worrisome because those tiles protected the shuttle from burning up during re-entry. Which is exactly how another shuttle, Columbia, uh, was eventually lost uh, much later on. And problem number three, the two boosters on each side. They used a solid propellant, so there was no way to stop the combustion once it started. If everything went wrong during the ascent, the rockets would still be going full blast. And to make things worse, those boosters were built in segments and then put together like a stack of cylinders. So to avoid leaks between those segments, there were O-rings where the cylinders met. But when the boosters were recovered and refurbished after they were used, engineers discovered that that seal was often compromised. So there was a major risk that the propellant would leak out and then burn uncontrollably outside during the ascent. So, what was the plan B if things went wrong? I know that the Saturn V rocket had a smaller rocket on top so that the crew could bail out in case of a problem. Not possible here because it was a shuttle, not a rocket. And what about some kind of ejection seat? That was seriously considered, but eventually that was ruled out because it was just too heavy and cumbersome. So what kind of safety measure are we talking about then? Well, basically none. Uh, the shuttle was sold as a safe and boring shuttle, so it would be like a school bus. No emergency rocket, no ejection seat. It would be inherently safe. Except we just saw that it wasn't. Was NASA public about the risks? Not really. All of these problems that I just mentioned, they were identified internally. But there was a lot of pressure to continue the flights because NASA had overpromised on the program and they had to deliver to keep their budget. And that's when NASA came up with a bright idea to revive public interest in a program. Let's bring a civilian on board. And not a civilian like Judith Resnick, who was a professional astronaut by that point, but a random civilian without any special training. That's where the Teacher in Space program came in. Yes, we're focusing on Judith Resnick today, but there was another woman on board Challenger that day in 1986, Krista McAuliffe. As well as five men, the normal shuttle crew with seven people in all. Correct. All right, now we've given you some background on the space shuttle program, and it's now time to cover STS-51L, that ill-fated Challenger mission that launched in January of 86. Well, it's not time, actually. We went into too many technical details about the design flaws of the space shuttle, so we need to take our fourth musical break. Are we done with the 1970s yet? Not quite. Here is Walking on the Moon by The Police, and that was released in 1979. Fun fact, the music video for that song that was filmed at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Cape Canaveral. Right, where Judith Resnick was preparing to launch into space for a second time.
You're listening to Your Grandma Rocks on KBYS. I'm Rebecca Harris. Et je suis Philippe Jean. Today, we are retracing the life of astronaut Judith Resnick. By the 1980s, she was a professional astronaut with one space shuttle flight under her belt. In January 1986, she was scheduled to fly on a second mission alongside teacher Krista McAuliffe. Which day specifically? Well, January 22nd at first. But then there was one delay after another, either due to weather or some silly technical glitches. So much for a reliable, boring shuttle concept. Yeah, and eventually the date was set for January 28th, six days late. And that was unusually cold for Florida that day, but NASA insisted, no more delays. Let's just scrub up the ice from the orbiter and go. Engineers were concerned that the O-rings in the booster, they would become brittle because of the cold weather. But management overruled them. That launch was anything but routine. The teacher in space publicity stunt had been a great success, so every classroom in America was watching the launch on TV. As well, the families of the astronauts were at Cape Kennedy to see the launch in person, or as it turned out, the deaths of their loved ones. Let's go through the events of the day step by step. First, ignition. 11.38 a.m. local time. That went well, right? Well, almost. There was a puff of black smoke out of one of the boosters on the side. You mean where those seals were not foolproof? Yeah, that had happened before actually, but without consequence, so the launch continued as planned. Anyway, once those candles were lit, there was no way to stop them. Next step, ascent. What would be the most dangerous part? Well, at T plus 37 seconds, there was a lot of rattling as the shuttle experienced more wind shear than ever before, but the orbiters survived. The next scary moment was breaking the sound barrier, which the shuttle did at T plus 40 seconds, again, without incident. And then there's something called max Q, which is when the shuttle is really starting to go fast, but it's still low enough in the atmosphere that air resistance is still a factor. So maximum aerodynamic pressure. When is that? T plus 51 seconds. Everything still okay? Uh, well, no. By that point, the leak on the booster had reopened, and there was a plume of smoke coming out uh, from the side of the booster. Did people notice it? Well, not at the time. Everything I'm describing happened 20,000 feet up in the air in a matter of seconds. Uh, that was only noticed when reviewing the footage after the fact. Okay, next step. At T plus 68 seconds, Houston asked the shuttle to, quote, stroll up. Because Max-Q was behind them, now they could accelerate again without fear of damage, damaging the shuttle. At least that's what they thought. Except that by that point, there was a major fire coming out of one of the rocket boosters. Not the best time to pick up even more speed. And four seconds later, at T plus 72 seconds, the booster simply broke off. The shuttle was now completely out of whack because it had lost one booster and it immediately began to disintegrate. The large orange external tank imploded and the orbiter was engulfed in a giant fireball. That's the image that is seared in everyone's memory. The two boosters going helter-skelter, the external tank explosion in the center, and the orbiter somehow in the middle of it. And that's when every teacher all over America looked at their TV, looked at their students, they said, uh-uh, and they turn off the TV monitor. Well, what happened after the explosion? I don't want to be too gory, but how and when did Judith Resnick and her crewmates die? Well, the orbiter was later recovered from the ocean floor and allies, so we actually know what happened next, and it's disturbing. Uh, the orbiter broke apart in the explosion, but the crew cabin itself survived and continued on its way. Like, still up, even without the boosters. Well, by that point, the cabin had so much momentum that it continued on a ballistic trajectory, like a cannonball, until it finally lost speed and began to fall back to Earth for 2 minutes and 45 seconds until it hit the Atlantic Ocean. What about the crew inside? Please tell me that they died instantly during the explosion itself. Well, sadly, probably not. The crew cabin remained intact, as I said, and the G-forces during the explosion itself, they were survivable. Do you mean to tell me that they spent two minutes and 45 seconds falling to their death and that they were conscious the whole time? Well, some of them were at least. A bunch of the switches were moved around in the cockpit, so apparently the pilot was still alive and he was trying to regain control of the aircraft. Though, well, obviously that was futile by that point. What about our lady Judith Resnick? Well, that's where it gets incredible. When analyzing the wreckage, NASA discovered that some of the astronauts had activated their personal egress air packs. Which is? Basically their oxygen mask. Uh, which meant that some astronauts were alive and conscious since they had to do it. Was Judith Resnick one of them? Yes, she was one of the people that activated her emergency air supply. But there's something even more incredible. The air supply for the captain was activated using a switch on the back of his seat. So it was probably activated by the person sitting behind him 
i.e. Judith Resnick. Wow. So she's in the middle of a giant explosion. She survives massive G-forces. She's tumbling back to her death, and she still has the presence of mind to activate her emergency oxygen supply and take care of one of her crewmates. That's just incredible. That is the right stuff right here. Uh, she did a lot of amazing things in her life, but to me, that single moment, right before she died, that is the most impressive of all. So how did she die then? Did she eventually drown in the ocean? Oh no, when the cabin finally hit the ocean, the G-forces there were so massive that anyone still alive at that point would have died instantly, including Judith Resnick. How tragic. I really need another musical break to process it. You know who should have been on your list? David Bowie. When it comes to space songs for the 70s, you can't beat him. I saved him for last. Do you feel like space oddity? <laughs> That'll do. Take it from here, Ziggy. Ground control to Major Tom. Ground control to Major Tom. Take your protein pills and put your helmet on. Ground control to Major Tom. Seven. Sing countdown engines on Three, two, check ignition and may God's love be with you. Bienvenue à tous. Je m'appelle Philippe Girard. And I'm Rebecca Harris, and you're listening to Your Grandma Rocks. Today, we retrace the life of Judith Resnick, an astronaut who died in the Shuttle Challenger in 1986. What happened after the, that disaster, Philippe? It was a national trauma, as you'd expect. A lot of people had been watching that live on TV, including a lot of kids. Kind of like 9-11. 
How long did it take before they figured out the cause of the explosion? Well, some of the engineers who had warned beforehand about the faulty O-rings were watching the launch live, so they knew instantly. Uh, there was a public inquiry, so NASA could not hide the problem anymore, and they eventually fixed the flawed design. Only with the boosters, though. The problem with the heat shield remained, and that led to the loss of a second crew on Columbia. Eventually, the entire shuttle program was scrapped as neither safe nor cheap. Unfortunately, 14 people had to die before that became clear, and that included an incredible woman named Judith Resnick. Well, what a life. We're glad we could share it with you. Quelle vie incroyable, en effet. This program was funded by the Juliet Hartner Grant for Women in the Humanities. And by the History Department at McNeese. Thank you and goodbye. Merci. Au revoir.